Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, and thank you to Mark, uh, especially for inviting me to give this talk. And I've, I've repeatedly said on email, and even I think maybe when I saw Mark join the strikes, um, this is probably one of the more nerve-wracking talks to give, where you're talking to a group of people who sit very solidly, in my view, outside of your immediate area of interest and expertise. But what I hope to show you in the next kind of 30, 35 minutes or so is, is a bit about geology in general and basin analysis in particular. So that's how we use subsurface geophysical data to look inside the earth. Because I think um, geosciences and artificial intelligence and deployment of machine learning techniques, I think the approaches and scientific philosophies are common to both of them. Um, for example, subsurface analysis is very multi-scalar, so we often use very detailed data sets, so geochemical data sets or petrological, so we look at microscopes at rocks, all the way up to imaging large-scale deformations of the Earth's crust and trying to understand the Earth's structure. So that scale range is interesting, but also on top of that, the data we're using is very quantitative, but we're actually having to interpret it in a very qualitative way. And it's probably no surprises to you if you didn't know this already, but in the last, say, five years or so, um, artificial intelligence and things like that have been, people have been working very hard at how to apply it to geoscience problems because of that, that challenge of having huge, huge, vast data repositories. And I'm going to show you the size of some of these data sets, but then having this really messy headspace, the human being is filtering that to come up with some sort of plausible interpretation. Um, and even if you don't learn anything, hopefully you'll be excited by some of the geology you'll, you'll find out from me, from me today. So what I'll do with that introduction, I'll just go to sharing my, my screen here. And hopefully um, you can see that screen. So this talk is called 3D Size and Reflection Data. And has the geological Hubble retained its focus? And we all know the Hubble telescope was this, you know, this, this, great, um, this great invention that was going to allow us to see further and more accurately into, into space. And it was going to do wonders for astrophysics. And 3D seismic data was viewed in the same way, but for what's under your feet. So rather than a tool which was allowing us to see further and more high resolution into space, we were going to be able to do that in the Earth's subsurface. And so this talk, the title is inspired by this paper from 2005 by two heroes of mine, Joe Cartwright and Mads Dusa there on the bottom left. And um, there's a lot of text in the abstract, but I just want to point out this kind of key bit here. So, you know, this data that I'm going to talk to you about, it allows you to image from a few meters over tens of thousands of meters, square kilometers. And it's this idea that it's the geological Hubble and it was going to stimulate um, geological studies in the future because if we can understand form we can probably go to things like kinematics and mechanics as well but we need to be able to see these large-scale structures as there are they are as they exist under the earth's surface today and what was very interesting about this type of data is it's primarily collected for the oil and gas industry around exploration and it was only in the early noughties really did those data which cost millions tens of millions of pounds to collect the 3d seismic data were people literally just giving them to academics. So there was this huge explosion in this area of basin analysis prompted by this type of data. And I think one thing I'm excited to talk to you about is, you know, looking now into the future for geosciences, what role could artificial intelligence and machine learning, the deployment of machine learning algorithms do for these huge data sets we now have, which we basically can't really handle, they're too big now. So what's a geologist's view of, um, of this sort of geophysical data? Well, you know, there's those people who like producing images, the seismic nerds. And, and for those of you who don't know, geophysicists have often come from a maths or physics background. So they look like this cool character on the, on the left. And, and, you know, and then there's us, the geologists, and we're the hipsters on the right there. And, then we, and we take these images, we take these data, and we kind of do these cool, awesome things with it and get our nature papers and so on. Um, so there's always this kind of, combative disparity between how geologists view themselves as the interpreters of the data and the geophysicists as the collectors of the data. But obviously, if you go and speak to a geophysicist, the perception is very different in that they think of themselves as these erudite, wise people with these long equations on the left-hand side, and they're talking about things in a slightly abstract fashion uh, to a geoscientist, because we know rocks, okay? And they look at us like this on the right hand side, like these kids with their colouring crayons. And what these geologists do is they take these amazing data sets that take tens of millions of pounds to collect and take ages to process. Uh, and then they just draw all over them and say they can see volcanoes underneath the earth. 
And you know, clearly both of those groups of people had uh, value in terms of advancing our understanding of the earth because you need good imaging of the subsurface of the earth and you need a qualitative understanding of what are plausible geometries under the earth to interpret those quantitative data. So to get us all on the same page, I've put together what I call the Idiot's Guide to um, Reflection Seismology. So this is why rocks and wiggles are related. So, you know, if you think of what a rock looks like, you probably think, well, how do we use these geophysical techniques to image them? Well, what it is, is very simply, we have an acoustic source behind a boat. So let me just go down to uh, laser pointer. So what we have is a boat and it's sailing and it's pulling behind it a source of um, shock waves of, of acoustic energy. And in this case, it's an air gun. It's something that leads to, releases a big bubble under the water in this marine acquisition, because this is a, an acquisition uh, on water. Those sound waves go down these black lines, they go down into the Earth's subsurface and they bounce back off the rock layers. And we listen to those, those, that sound using these things called hydrophones, which are trailing behind the boat. So we're, we're sending down a pulse, a certain signal and frequency of data, and we're collecting some filtered signal back at these hydrophones in here. What drives how much energy comes back to the, Earth's, to the hydrophones is, is driven by something called the acoustic impedance, and that reflects the density and velocity of the different rock types. And that drives something called the reflection coefficient. And the reflection coefficient is then um, you know, how much, what ratio is it the incident energy versus the reflected energy? And because some of that energy continues down into the Earth's subsurface. And why does that work when you're trying to look at rocks? Well, primarily it's because different rocks have different compressional P wave velocities. The sound waves go different speeds through different rocks. All I want you to take from here is the red arrow on the right hand side. Sedimentary rocks, so things like sandstones and limestones, have relatively slow acoustic wave speeds two to five kilometers per second. Whereas if we look at things like igneous rocks, so crystalline rocks, granites, basalts, lava rocks, they have acoustic wave speeds of above five. So you can imagine if you start to juxtapose and layer those rocks in a different way, you're gonna drive changes in the acoustic impedance and the reflection coefficient. So our tool is detecting all of these physical changes, but remember, and this will be interesting to get your views on this later on, that, that response is non-unique because some limestones can look like some sandstones acoustically, but actually what we want to know as geoscientists is which of those two it is. And so we have these non-unique interpretations arising because of uncertainties or the non-uniqueness of those physical characteristics. So let's have a look at a simple 2D example here so before we start looking at some, some profiles. This is from a borehole in the North Sea. What I want to show you here is the, is the scale on the left-hand side. Just imagine that as meters. So this is 100 meters, 200 meters, 300 meters. And this borehole starts, in this case, two and a half kilometers beneath the North Sea, so from the seabed. We've got a, we, we can, in that borehole, we can measure a bunch of properties. Uh, one is the sonic, you know, the, the sonic velocity of the rock. So we put these sensors against the borehole. One is the density. We can measure how dense the rocks are. And that's those two tracks in the middle. You can see that we go down through this mudstone, so a muddy layer has certain properties, and then we go into a chalk layer, which is not only denser, you can see there's an increase in the density across this red line, but also the velocity is higher. So we're increasing the density and velocity, and because of that, we increase the, we have a change in the uh, reflection, the acoustic impedance. We have a reflection coefficient increase here, and that gives us the reflection at the top of the chalk. So that's just a very simple two-dimensional view of how the rocks are talking to this thing here on the left, what the seismic data traces. And encoded in this trace, you can see it going back and forth, is the properties of the rocks that we're acoustically imaging with this technique. So what does it look like? So this is a seismic profile then in 2D. This is from offshore southern Norway. And you know, the seabed is effectively at the top of this image for scale, just because this is one thing I think non-geologists always find really hard to get their head around. This is one kilometer for scale. So this is about 25 kilometers of the Earth's subsurface. We're seeing in an, essentially an X-ray from the seabed down through this vertical scale, which is about three kilometers or so. You'll notice the scale in the Y domain, and a lot of the things I'm going to show you is not in meters or feet, 
it's in this thing called two-way time because we're, we're recording how long it takes, not how far, how long it takes for the sound waves to go down and back up. And then we, if we know the velocities, we can obviously go from um, two-way time from through the velocity step back into meters or feet domain. So what you can see in here is a bunch of light colored areas. We can see these more reflective, redder and blacker bits. And these are the reflective rock layers. So what you're looking at, imagine you're standing on the seaside with a big sea cliff behind you. You can see the layers of rock. That's essentially what you're looking at here, but on a massive, massive scale. So that's in terms of structural analysis. So you can see that um, where I'm tracing out here, you can see here there's these, um, these breaks in the reflections. You can see these reflections, this red comes across and goes up, goes across and comes up. These are giant fractures. These are something called faults. So you may have heard of normal fault lines. These are seismically imaged normal faults. And then in terms of stratigraphic analysis, and by that I mean things like rivers and deltas and the way sediments are moved across the Earth's landscape and deposited, we can also use these data for that sort of analysis, not just structural as I'm showing above, but here we can see these white dashed lines. You can see these white dashed lines going up and down. That's where somebody's interpreted some ancient river channels. And by ancient, these rocks here, which these channels are in a Miocene, these are 20 million years old and buried about four kilometers off the seabed offshore Brazil. Um, so we're looking at like crazy old rocks and super giant structures with these data. Why do we bother with these data and what are the challenges associated with using them? So here, um, I'm, we're looking in map view here and what you've got are 2D seismic profiles. So here's a 2D seismic profile. There's another one here two kilometers apart. There's another one here two kilometers apart and likewise in the east-west direction. So you sail your boat, you collect some data, you go two kilometers across, you sail again, you collect some data and you build up a pseudo 3D cube of the Earth's subsurface using 2D data, like I'm showing here. So on those seismic profiles, like that one, that one, and that one, we might see these faults. So you can see on these images on the right-hand side, here's one of these fault lines. You can see these different colors go down on this side. These different colors go down on this side. And essentially, we just join the dots, right? We just draw a black line between the green dots where we see those faults, and we, we have a an image of the earth of what the fracture looks like. And likewise with the channel as I'm showing here, we see these channel in here, we see a channel in here, maybe on that line and maybe on this line here, and then we just join up the dots. And so we have a channel which is slightly bendy and a fault which is slightly bendy. Hopefully you can see what the problem is here with 2D data. It leads to a problem of spatial aliasing. So what is going on in the areas between these 2D profiles, these slices we have through the Earth, because essentially we have no data between the green or blue dots. What we can have though instead is if we collect a 3D seismic data set, so we go and collect a 3D seismic data set, and, and in those sorts of data, they're quasi 3D in that the line spacing is normally as little as 12 and a half meters, so that's kind of the length of my house. And if you have a 3D data set, you can see what the impact is. You reduce the spatial aliasing, and suddenly you find out that instead of having one large normal fault, you have three small faults. And instead of having one slightly bendy river system deep beneath your feet, you have a very bendy river system. And why is that important? Well, if you're going to drill hydrocarbon wells, as shown in one, two, and three here, on your 2D data, thinking you're going to hit the black line, which is full of sand, you realize that actually those wells that you're drilling will miss it because you actually didn't in reality have any idea where those river channels were beneath your feet. So I'm going to now, having kind of hopefully um, told you a bit about the technique in general and, and, and the power of the three-dimensionality of it, and now I want to take you into my mind and show you some of the things I've been doing in terms of research in applying these sorts of data. And I want to do that by showing you a range of scale, all the way from the microscopic to kind of the macroscopic and up to the megascopic. So all the way from kind of looking at very, very small details in rocks, which I'm amazed about that you can use very small changes in the physical properties of rocks that give you an acoustic image that you can see in a data set which is hundreds of kilometers squared, all the way through to the megascopic on the right-hand side where we're talking about the large-scale workings of the Earth. So the first thing we're talking as geologists often is that um, 
these reflections, you know, these lines I've been showing you on these profiles equal time. So you deposit a rock layer, and you deposit another rock layer, and another rock layer on the Wednesday, and then one on the Thursday. And then when we image that, you know, that's telling us about the chronology, you know, that's the time and the evolution of the Earth. And that's kind of captured, if I can just play this video. So what we're seeing here is we're having sediment being delivered from the land on the left hand side. We've got the sea out in here, and then you'll see this thing building out here, which is what we call a delta. So this is like the Mississippi Delta. So can you see that thing builds out and the sea level changes? Sea level will rise now. It falls and then it rises back up. You can see we're depositing all these rock layers. And if I just pause it there, you can see all of these rock layers that I'm tracing out um, in here. You can see they're all timelines. And that's, a, that's like one of the irrefutable truths of geology. If you go and speak to a geologist, a bedding surface that you put your hand on, on the beach or something, or that you look at in these profiles, that is a timeline. That is not a Tuesday in the Jurassic. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's probably a Tuesday at some point, um, but it's a, it's a long-term uh, time surface. I'm gonna show you some examples where that breaks down in a very fundamental way. So this is some work which was led by Tilo Rono, who's on the top left. I always try and pay tribute to the people who did the work with us. So this is Tilo's PhD work with Mads, who's from Kevin Taylor. And what's exciting about this work is that it's, um, you know, as, as, as kind of feedstock for this seminar today. Kevin is a geochemist in the bottom left. Mads is a hardcore geophysicist in the middle and me and Tilo were the geologists. So this was a really nice area to bring together people with very different interests and different skill sets to reveal something we thought was quite cool and new. Um, and, you know, then there's a discussion we can have around that, of course. So let's get into it. So one thing that can happen is we have these rocks, this sediment, which is made of silica, so SiO2. And that silica is opaline, so opal A. And when we take a bit of opal, so a, like one of these dead little, you know, Mike, David Attenborough talks about all these like little silicious animals floating around in the sea. When they die and fall to the seabed in opal A, when they get buried, they turn to this thing called opal CT. So we get this recrystallization of their, their bodies, so they're called tests. So you can see here, this is the animal um, with its test as it's died. We're looking here at a scanning electron microscope image. And here we can see it's been recrystallized into a much finer form due to heat and burial. So what we know about this process is, um, if you just concentrate on the, the y-axis in here, opal A goes to opal CT, so crystalline opal, and eventually changes to quartz. And that is a temperature dependent process and because it's temperature dependent, and because the temperature in the Earth increases by around 30 degrees per kilometer, it's also a depth dependent process. So that transition between those three silica phases can tell us about the temperature and about the depth. And we saw that when we went and looked at this borehole from the North Sea, and again, scale is important here. This is one kilometer, so that's 900 meters to 100 meters, sorry, that's 100 meters there. So we're looking at about a kilometer long bit of borehole here. So you go to that borehole, you, you, you sample it, you get lots of little bits of rock, and it takes ages. And then you put it in a big fancy machine. And what it shows you is that there's this unit here, which is about 300 meters thick, which is full of opal A. We have a unit then below where opal A decreases and opal CT increases. So that makes sense, right? Because all the opal, at some depth and heat is being transferred into this opal CT domain. And there's lots of interesting questions about how you handle these sorts of data, which I, again, we can go into later. On the right hand side is one of the key logs though. When we're measuring that borehole, we're also measuring porosity. And porosity is the space within the rock. So think about your bath sponge, lots of holes, it's a very porous material. Think about a crystalline rock like granite, no holes, low porosity. What you can see is as we go from the opal A to opal CT is there's a big decrease in porosity. So the rocks collapse and because they collapse, they get denser and because they get denser, the P wave velocity, the speed at which those sound waves go through it increases. So we can see there's a big increase in there. And it's a, it's a deep, what we call a dehydration reaction. You know, one thing that happens is the, the bugs collapse and all the water goes out into the seawater. So opal A, Opal CT, 
And then we have this so-called transformation zone where we go from opal A into opal CT and there's a slight change in, the, in this measurement of porosity. So given that microscopic set of analyses we did, um, what does that then say about this tool I talked about at the beginning of the talk, you know, the seismic data? Well, let's go to offshore Norway. Let's stay with that same borehole on the left-hand side. I've left the same zones on there in gray, blue, and dark gray. And now we're gonna look at a seismic profile which goes through that borehole location. So this is one of these big x-rays underneath the seabed. There's this, this is seawater at the top. This is the seabed offshore Norway. And you can see all these rock layers in here, different brightnesses because of the different properties of the rock. But one thing that's quite hidden in here, all of these rock layers are telling you again about those timelines. These are, you can see the geological time scale on the right hand side for those of you that are interested. This is Paleocene, Eocene, Oligocene. So 60, 50 to 40 million years ago. If you look in detail here, I'm just tracing out, there's a very weird, vague line, which is sort of going through the data set and kind of comes through and eventually comes out and through here. And that is this transformation zone. That decrease in porosity is actually giving us a rise in the density, the acoustic impedance and therefore reflection. And critically, because that transition is temperature and depth dependent, it crosses geological timelines. So all of these rocks in here are all timelines, they're dipping, but this very subtle one is, is kind of cross-cutting. I'm going to show you one more spectacular example of this now. Here's another example from somewhere called the Murra Base in offshore Norway. Again, hopefully your eyes are all attuned to these images. Think of them a bit like x-rays. There's layers of rock in here with these different colours. The most obvious reflection is this one here, isn't it? This black and red I'm tracing out, which goes up and down and up and down and looks kind of weird. If you make a map of that up and down, it looks like this. So this is about three kilometers offshore, beneath the seabed offshore Norway. And you get this thing, which essentially looks like bubble wrap. It looks like this very amazing bubble wrap texture. And just for, just for, um, how should I put this? Just for scale here. Um, this is a, this color bar I'm using here is vertical relief. So everything that's red is sort of popping out the screen towards you and everything that's purple or green is sort of in the screen towards you. So these red areas we're seeing here on this map are these high areas on the image on the left hand side. So there's these bubbles, these things which are popping out the front of this. And this is one of these um, diagenetic boundaries. We know from borehole data that we go from opal A to opal CT at this burial depth of around about two kilometers, given that the geothermal gradient is about 30 kilometers, 30 degrees per kilometer. And so we can see that in here. And so we, we have this texture. So, you know, what that, like we've gone from this diagenet, diagenetic SEM, like macro, micro scale thing, all the way up to imaging these things. And this scale bar, sorry, I'll just move you all because you're sort of in my view here. Um, this is a 10 kilometer scale bar. So now we've gone from seeing these things in a microscope or an SEM all the way up to seeing them over kind of 100 square kilometers. And even now it still blows my mind that we're able to do that. Um, but again, there's non-uniqueness in the, in the interpretation. So what does this mean for this seismic diagenesis before I go on to another example? What this suggests is that if you imagine the sediments are being a subsiding into the earth, everything's subsiding down and down and down. So we'd expect that transition from opal A to CT, which is stationary at the 60 degrees isotherm, would be advancing through those rocks. What this texture suggests is that's not the case. We actually have times where that boundary goes forward faster than it does at the side. And we get this, we advance that boundary faster here than we do to the left or right. And again, so we have this kind of incremental advance of that boundary. Um, and we think it's being driven by the fact that maybe in some of these areas, there's more fractures in the rocks. And because the rocks are more fractured, it means that their permeability, which is the ability of fluids or gases to move through a material, the permeability is higher. So that fluid can go forward quicker, convert the opal A to opal CD, CT in that location quicker, and then that's the way it advances. 
So let's move on to something a bit more whiz bang. So hopefully that gave you an idea of kind of the various scales of analysis we do and how we try and step through those scales and relate these very detailed rock properties to these very uh, mega scale observations we make. I'm going to take you to something which is close to my heart, which are, which are kind of volcanoes and, and what we call crustal magnetism, the way rocks melt in the Earth's surface and how that molten material migrates through the Earth's crust and eventually comes out on the Earth's surface in the form of volcanoes. And if you think about it, volcanoes are a really cool thing to look at for two reasons. One is they're terrifying, and if you live near them, they pose a very real geohazard. But scientifically, why they're interesting is it's very hard to study volcanoes. They're big, scary hot. It's really dangerous to stand around on them. So what would be useful is if we can look at ancient volcanoes, which we image in these sorts of data, and try and understand their geometry and um, how they behaved in the deep time, as we call it, geologists use the term deep time, tens of millions of years ago, to try and better inform what active volcanoes are doing. We can often try and do this in you know, modern areas, we might try and use uh, some low resolution geophys geophysical technique. So this is what we call seismic refraction data. And essentially, this image here from Mount St. Helens is showing you the speed at which sound waves are traveling through the earth underneath Mount St. Helens. Where the sound waves are going slow are in red, and where they're going quickly is in blue. So what does this image mean? It probably means that where we've got red in here, we have this labeled shallow magma storage zone. This is where we don't really have rock. We have what we call a magma mush. So there's bits of fluids, there's bits of crystals. You know, you can imagine that the rigidity of the material is what allows the sound wave to go quickly through it. So if you start having lots of fluid in there, everything, so all the sound waves are slopping around. So we have slow acoustic velocities. Um, but it's quite a low resolution image. Just for scale, this is five kilometers here. Uh, and this, it's a, the vertical scale is the same. So we have this very broad sort of fuzzy picture, which we might try and um, enhance here on the right hand side by plotting on small earthquakes. So here you're seeing the, pur the purple circles are um, these small earthquakes um, and they form because magma as it migrates through the rocks, it pushes them aside and fractures them and it releases fracture energy and the energy in the form of earthquakes. And so what this says, suggests to a geologist is that as you come up underneath Mount St. Helens, maybe there's a distributed zone up which magma is ascending and then it becomes more pipe-like and focused through the middle of this magma chamber underneath Mount St. Helens. So it's all very cool, but it leaves you with a very crude image, in this case of Mount St. Helens, is sort of plumbing system, you know, the, the way magma is coming into it. We can go to modern volcanoes as well and try and look at how they are deforming to try and understand how magma is going um, inside them. So on the left hand side here is something called a tiltometer. Uh, a tiltometer we put on the volcano as magma comes up, it actually starts to deform the Earth's surface, so you can see here, and there's lots of interesting machine learning work going on in the space of earthquake and volcanic deformation for anybody who's interested. Um, and as magma inflates, the magma chamber sort of inflates, if you will, or the magma body inflates, we deform the volcano. And you can see the tiltometer, the tilt meter is tilted, so we've got a tilt versus time plot on the bottom. Just as the volcano is about to erupt, we've really tilted the tilt meter. We can see we've got a large amount of tilt, and then the volcano erupts and we get a deflation. So we can use this tilt meter to try and understand how melt is migrating underneath these volcanic cones or edifices, um, geologists often call them. But if you think about it, one thing we could do with our seismic reflection technique is look at these ancient systems and it's because going back to that slide I showed you about the P wave velocities, the P wave velocities between sedimentary rocks and igneous rocks is huge and it's shown here in this image from Greenland. This is 50 meters for scale of this mountainside in Greenland you can see these layered sedimentary rocks, which are these whites and greys, and then the black of these sills. You can see this black sill, and the sill is a crystalline bit of magma. So it's, it used to be bloody hot, going through those sedimentary rocks, then it cooled down and crystallized. So that's a, an igneous rock. And you can imagine here, you'd have a huge change in reflection coefficient at this boundary between the sedimentary rocks and the igneous rocks. And so this is some work I've been doing with Chiliang Sun here on the top right, and then Craig McGee, who's at Leeds. And we've been using these data to try and understand these volcanic systems. And this is what it looks like in seismic data. 
Again, you know hopefully what these images look like now. This is the seawater offshore southern Australia. Scale on this line is huge. This is a 10 kilometer scale bar here. So I think the length of the line I'm going to show you here is about 70 or 80 kilometers. And the vertical axis here, just convert that to meters. It's about 400 meters. So we're looking through well over a kilometer of rock. The first thing your eyes are hopefully drawn to are these, these cones in through here. That one there and this one here. And also these bright blobs under here, these bright blues and oranges. These are ancient volcanoes beneath the seabed of Australia. Amazingly, the blue horizon, you can see this blue line I'm tracing out here, that is 42 million years old. That is Eocene in age. So we're seismically imaging 42 million year old volcanoes. We can see inside those volcanoes, you can see there's some layers inside. And you can also see that these things which we call sills, these, these things that fed magma up to these volcanoes. So we can reconstruct in 3D with all the caveats of the non-uniqueness of the image we're looking at here, we can try and reconstruct in 3D that magma coming system. So I'm going to animate now as we go towards the right. Here's a giant volcano in here. This one's over a kilometre tall, so small compared to some volcanoes, but it's still a fairly big volcano in terms of size and imaging. We come over here as well. You can see here's another sill in through here, this bright feature. This is something we call a laclith. It's a fancy geological word. Um, you'd hear another igneous intrusion. What's quite neat in here though, hopefully you can see the blue line goes up and down and then it goes way up and way down, way up and way down here. We have these things which we call folds. So these are what we call anticlines as a geological term. And those folds are forming because when that sill came into the basin, we intruded that magma, we inflate that sill, so we pump lots of magma in and we lift the overburden, we lift the roof of the earth effectively above that magma sill and we deform the then Eocene seabed offshore. And so this kind of talks to that slide I just showed you before about the tilt meter. So imagine having a tilt meter on here on the day when this sill came in. You'd, and what we've got here in this seismic image is a, is a much more unique way of inverting the amount of deformation on the blue horizon for the size of the thing underneath. And that's the thing when we're looking at those uh, tilt meter data is often quite non-unique. We have some tilt meter data, but as you can imagine, if we're deforming the volcano in different places in different ways, is that a lot of magma at very deep depths? Is that a little bit of magma at very shallow depths? They could both give us the same signal. And, and it's also to do with something called the elastic properties of the rocks. So do the rocks compact when they're pushed against by magma or are they stiff and just they deform in a much more comply um, in, a, in a kind of brittle way. <clears throat> and again, just to show you that kind of idea that we can use these data to understand ground deformation, this is now going to Northwest Australia. And here's another seismic reflection image here. And I've shaded in red here, um, an igneous sill. And you can see here, these black lines I've drawn in here, these are these things called normal faults, so these fractures. And what's kind of neat here is if you look at the red horizon, you can see it comes up in a dome, it comes down over the top of this igneous sill. But not only do we have a fold, you can also see that red horizon has these breaks in it. You can see there and there. So obviously when we were deforming the Earth's surface above this inflating sill, we were also um, faulting it. We weren't just lifting it, we were faulting it because there's the stresses being imposed on the rocks caused them to fracture. It's a beautiful 3D world we live in, so we're not limited to just taking this one X-ray. We can make a map of the red horizon. So um, I'm not sure if there's a comparator for you there, but effectively you can just draw lots of lines like those geologists in the, with the crayons I showed you at the start of the talk. We can draw like lots of pictures on these data and we can come up with a beautiful map like this. And sorry for the colorblind people in the audience, this might be a bit hard for you to, to work with, but I'll try and draw it out. But this bit in the center here is a dome and that's the dome you can see in two dimensions in here. The black dashed line is the outline of the sill. So you can see the dome sits right above the sill and you can see the faults on top. So we can actually look and map out the volume of the fold. We can map out the volume of the igneous material that formed that fold and actually try and be much more predictive in terms of um, the ground deformation. I'll skip that. And this was work done by Freddie Briggs, who's who was um, an MSI student, and Bogdan Glenkov, who was an MSI student with us at Imperial College. Um, there's some data, I won't dwell on this, just to say one small thing. 
This is the thickness of the intrusion, so how thick this intru these intrusions are. This is the amplitude of the fold, so how, 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 yeah, the kind of relief on that fold, so how much the Earth's surface is deformed. And this line in here is a one-to-one -one line. So arguably, if all of the magma that's going in is being transformed into uplift of the Earth's surface, all the data should sit on that one-to-one -one line. But as you can see from the data set, which we've collected from, in this case, offshore southern Australia, you can see most of them are sitting way below that one-to-one -one line. So we have a thicker sill than we have deformation above it. And that's quite important because it probably then says to you that if you have a minor amount of ground deformation above a volcano, you may actually have quite a lot more magma underneath your feet. And that's an important thing when you're trying to put some sort of stochastic bounds on um, the uncertainty around um, the, the volume of magma during um, volcanic events. And like I just kind of said a bit about the magma plumbing system, I just like this image here because it's kind of super cool. Um, this is one of these big volcanoes offshore um, Australia. The green horizon here is this Eocene, and you can see these layers of lava rock actually inside the volcano, so I'm tracing them out. So again, with like modern volcanoes, what you can't do is see inside them because you can't get a bloody digger and dig the side out and see these layers. But we can actually do quite a lot of cool work trying to work out how uh, volcanoes um, build, essentially. So do volcanoes build upwards and outwards, or do they build by... Uh, um, you know, eruptions coming out their sides rather than their tops, and, and there's some interesting questions there. Um, I think I'll just go to one other kind of um, thing before I move on to the final few slides. This idea of looking um, inside volcanoes, um, you know, kind of touched on that by, here's another image from this is offshore China we can actually look at the lava flows around them. So you can see there's this volcano in here, and hopefully if I can trace with me, you can see there's this bright reflection coming out in here. And we can use a bunch of tools in the uh, software we use to kind of make maps of those. And this is a map of that layer. And you can see this, this dim area here is actually the volcano itself, but these bright ribbons coming down through here, these are actually lava flows. And this, this volcano here is about 16 million years old, now extinct but it does allow us to measure the volume of material coming out of, of volcanoes, so the volume of lava erupted from them. And again, lots of numbers. The punchline is that with this technique, what we're seeming to see now is that the lava flows, which, which kind of go away from volcanoes, contain a lot more material than the actual volcano itself. So the volcano cone, is only between three and 50% of the total volume of material extruded from the, um, from the system. So if you go and want to see how active a volcano is, just measuring the size of the volcano might not be that good. You'd need to have a much better constraint on, on the size of the lava flows, which can go tens of kilometers away from them. So I think I just want to go on to one final kind of example here, because I wanted to take questions. Um, and I showed this image earlier on. Um, this idea that with 2D data, we have this spatial aliasing problem. And with 3D data, we, we mitigate that because we have a denser sampling. And that leads us to see more geological complexity as shown here on the left. And if we think about normal faults, um, some of you will be familiar that normal faults and thrusts cause earthquakes. So when these fault lines slip, they cause earthquakes. The San Andreas Fault is a transform fault. The earthquake sequences in the Apennines in the central Italy, which killed hundreds of people, they were on these normal faults. And the earthquakes, which have been so damaging in New Zealand, they are on thrust faults. So understanding the geometry and size of these faults is important for trying to forecast the likely energy release from an earthquake during one of these slip events. And that's captured in this image on the right hand side. So look at A. Green is the Earth's surface, and this two normal faults. There's one here and there's one here behind it. And at the Earth's surface, there's two fractures. We'd see two fractures at the Earth's surface and they're associated with their own fault surface. And if we nuclear an earthquake on that, the red star, we, there's, a, there's good observational data that the, the size of the earthquake scales with the size of the fault. So if you have a longer fault with bigger displacement, it can generate a magnitude, magnitude seven earthquake. Um, whereas if you have a smaller one, you might have a much smaller earthquake. So you want to know the size. 
The problem with that is if we only have the Earth's surface observations, we don't know. What we can see in B though here is sometimes when we have two fractures at the Earth's surface, in fact, that fault surface is geometrically more complicated. And instead of being just one, two fault surfaces, it's actually physically one large fault surface beneath our feet. And that fault would be capable of generating a significantly larger earthquake. So remember, back to the image I showed earlier on, these three faults theoretically would cause smaller earthquakes than the fault imaged in the 2D data, which went all the way from the left of the image to the right. So we'd have a different um, forecast and prediction there. Here's just an image of a normal fault, just to show that it's not just uh, things people draw in Adobe Illustrator. This is now a kind of an oblique view, if you will, of a normal fault. Two kilometers for scale, so these might be a bit curious for you to get your heads around. But what we're seeing here are two normal faults in through here at one level and at the bottom here, which I'm sort of drawing through, we see one fault. So if we take a series of slices through this fault, and um, this is actually, this, this animation's a bit wrong. If we look at this image here, this is a kind of slice through one of these data cubes and, what, and it's at the top of the fault in here. We see two faults. So our prediction would be, this fault's two kilometers long, this fault's two kilometers long, there's this space in the middle, so there's not going to be an earthquake there. So, you know, this is the biggest fault we can expect to use in our forecasting. If we go down to this level in here, though, we suddenly start to see, oh dear, here's one of these fractures, this black line in here, here's another fracture in here, but suddenly we start to see these fractures, there's a black fracture here, which is starting to almost link these two fractures. And then suddenly when we come down to this lowermost part of the fault in here, oh dear, we see that clearly that this fault is not two faults as we thought we saw at shallower depths. We actually have one long fault system, which if it slipped, would be capable of generating a significantly larger earthquake. And therefore, it's more likely that the scenario we saw in B in the previous slide is the more likely. So, you know, this again, trying to kind of map into your world, what does this mean? It means we need good images of the data, and it means that we need to have some sort of idea of filling in uncertainties of certainty, filling in uncertainties in our, in our, in our kind of um, uh, mind models, because that's what we're doing as geologists. So when geologists tell you something, sometimes it's good not to believe them, because oftentimes it's being built on biases. So this is this curious thing where we have these amazing data, and we're data-driven, and we're quantitative, but then when we're coming to interpret these things, we are having to bring to bear a lot of experiential knowledge and that is where I think geosciences gets messy. And I think that is where, talking to people with the interests that you have, there are advances to be made in the next kind of de few decades. So just to conclude, um, I've kind of, I, I kind of removed a few other bits and pieces in there, but I've gone through from like very small scale to kind of larger scale things. So looking at the scale change between microscopic deformations and something we call diagenesis, cementation, to seismic imaging, all the way through to megascopic, so how the Earth's crust is deforming. Um, so I'd like to leave it there, and I'm happy to take any questions, so I'll just top off the share.